Okay, take two. All right, sorry, everybody. Uh, I hope that you can hear me at this point in time. I believe so. All right, so apologies for this late delay there. Uh, welcome, everybody. And on behalf of the International Center for Counterterrorism, I'd like to welcome you to this briefing, A Thin Line, which focuses on the tension between freedom of speech and extremist hate speech. This briefing is organized in the context of ICTT's Transatlantic Fellowship Program, facilitated by the Municipality of The Hague. The program seeks, seeks to build and strengthen the mutual understanding between the United States and the Netherlands. My name is Julie Coleman and I'm a senior research fellow here at ICCT and I'll be chairing today's briefing. Uh, before turning it over to introduce our speakers today, I would just like to quickly introduce ICCT for those of you who may not be as familiar with us and the work that we do. ICCT is an independent think and do tank based in The Hague, working to provide research, evidence-based policy advice and practical on the ground solutions on matters regarding counterterrorism and countering violent extremism with a special focus on prevention and the rule of law. And finally, just uh, a few housekeeping notes because we have a full panel and now uh, because of some technical errors, we're a couple minutes behind. Uh, towards the end of the session today, there'll be about a 20 or 30 minute Q&A session. And so throughout the uh, presentations today, please feel free to enter any questions into the Q&A box that's within the, the Zoom uh, framework. And that will help us organize the questions uh, for our speakers. We will try to get to as many of the questions as possible today and a recording of today's briefing will be made available to all registered participants. And then finally, uh, to help us improve future live briefings, we would ask that when you exit out of the briefing, if you would complete a very short post-event survey that will automatically pop up on your screen, we'd greatly appreciate that. And we'd also recommend that you head over to our website, which is icct.nl, where you can register to uh, be on our listserv and kept informed of our future events as well as our publications. Our next live webinar is going to be held on the 11th of November, focusing on women, peace, and security. And we also have quite a few upcoming events and publications tied to the celebration of ICCT's 10th anniversary, which is taking place this year. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce the, the three speakers that we have today. Uh, first up is Lisbeth Vanderheide, who is responsible for the radicalization policy of the Hague Municipality. She heads a team of colleagues focused on preventing and countering polarization and radicalization in the city. In addition to her work at the municipality, she's a former senior research fellow and current associate fellow at ICCT, as well as a researcher and lecturer at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs, ISCHA at Leiden University. Second up, we have uh, Marluz van Norlos, who is an associate professor of criminal law at Tilburg University. Her areas of expertise include criminalization of speech, including hate speech, denial of gross human rights violations, glorifying terrorism, and more. Uh, she also is an expert in terrorist defenses, transitional justice, and a wide range of other topics. She's a member of the Myers Committee of Experts on International Immigration, Refugee, and Criminal Law, a member of the Advisory Commission on Fundamental Rights and the Functioning of Civil Servants, and she's also on the Dutch Study Committee on Speech Crimes. She co-authored a joint ICCT and Osser Institute research study on radical and extremist hate speakers in European member states. And she's considered one of the leading Dutch experts on hate, hate speech regulations. Very pleased to have her on our panel today. And last, but most certainly not least, we have Robert Kahn, who is a professor of law at St. Thomas University School of Law in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is our very first transatlantic fellow within the context of the ICCT Transatlantic Fellowship Program. And his dissertation, which was later published as Holocaust Denial and the Law, a Comparative Study, examined Holocaust denial litigation in France, Germany, and Canada, as well as the absence of similar litigation in the United States. His expertise covers the regulation of hate speech targeting Muslims, the debate over defamation of religions, European bans on the wearing of Islamic clothing and comparative perspective, as well as the over-enforcement of speech restrictions on African-Americans and the legal regulation of cross burnings in the United States. His work has appeared in international and comparative law journals at Duke, Vanderbilt, Brooklyn, Oregon, and Washington University in St. Louis, as well as in edited volumes published by Oxford and Cambridge University Press. We were originally hoping that Robert would be able to fly over to take part in person in our transatlantic fellowship program, but as with many things, COVID got in the way of that, 
but uh, we're especially pleased, therefore, that he's able to be on our panel today. Uh, so with that, I will start by turning it over to Lisbeth for some opening remarks. Hi there, everyone. Um, thank you, Julie, for these uh, introductory remarks. Um, let me keep it very short because I would like to uh, spend as much time as uh, many of you probably um, possible with uh, the speakers of today. Uh, my name is Lisbeth van der Heijden, and as Julie already said, I currently work at the municipality of The Hague, and um, I come from an academic background, so for me, um, I've been studying many things terrorism related, and then all of a sudden, uh, I've been thrown into the practice of um, yeah, how to uh, deal with the everyday realities of that on the streets of the city of The Hague. Uh, the Hague is the city of international peace and justice, of course, uh, very well known across the world for that. But when it comes to the problem that we're discussing today, it's something we're definitely dealing with on an everyday basis. Um, I think also in light of the terrible events in France today and um, earlier in the past month, um, there couldn't be a better time to be discussing these topics uh, than today. Um, what I wanted to just briefly uh, point to at the start of this is that this is not just an academic matter, as many of you very well know, but um, as a municipality, we're responsible for uh, dialogue with communities um, here on the streets of The Hague, um, keeping up relationships with different networks, um, maintaining order when um, people sidestep or um, try to intervene in the order of the city and confront them when necessary um, and maybe allow police or public prosecutors to um, prosecute if necessary or investigate. Um, that all seems quite straightforward in terms of who's responsible for doing what, but um, today we're dealing with an ever more complex batch of problems and people, you could say, in these times of um, almost daily protests and manifestations in many cities across the world and definitely also in The Hague. We're looking at um, a weird mix of uh, people showing up um, where we have QAnon adherents, anti-vaxxers, um, and everything in between on so many different topics where people have changing alliances uh, almost by the day. And it's our job to not just monitor that, but also to intervene where necessary. And that's where I think this discussion is um, going to be very helpful. Um, because in the end, um, for us, it's a very everyday, very real problem where we need to decide who do we focus on and what then can we do. So I'm hoping that on those two questions, um, our speakers of today can provide not just us at the municipality of The Hague, but many of you to uh, the answer to those two questions. Where do people cross the line when it comes to freedom of speech, to hate speech? And then of course, the million dollar question of what can we then do about it? Thank you very much. All right, um, so I guess it's uh, my turn now. Hello to you all. Um, it's really good to, to well, be here. Um, I, I see a lot of participants and I'm really honored to speak to you today about uh, extreme speech. And um, I hope you can all see the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Ah, yeah, it will. Um, be started now, uh, because what I would like to start with um, is uh, what are we talking about um, when we talk about extreme speech? Um, so the next uh, slide, please. <laughs> yes, a <and> next slide. <laughs> Yeah, so here you see two different but partly overlapping types of speech restrictions. Uh, on the one hand, hate speech, so laws that aim to protect minorities, um, uh, yeah, more in the context often of right-wing extremism, but it can also uh, be other types of extremism leading 
to this kind of speech. So incitement to hatred, group defamation, incitement to discrimination, etc. Uh, and I think, uh, well, as I said, it's partly over overlapping, but it can also be distinguished from incitement to terrorism, glorification or justification of terrorism, um, etc. So that's the kind of speech restriction that's really meant to protect the security of us all, so to say. Um, and today I will focus on the second class. Uh, so on the next slide, you will see an example. Uh, and I would like you to think a little bit about this example, um, to think if you uh, uh, would be of the opinion that it should be prohibited or not, and if so, why. Um, so this is the example of the, um, well, comic, Jodoné uh, Mbala Mbala in France, uh, who said uh, after the Paris Charlie Hebdo attack in 2015, uh, Je suis Charlie Koulibaly, uh, thus referring to um, one of the attackers of, uh, of one of the um, uh, terrorist occurrences uh, that was related to the Charlie Hebdo attack, um, Amedi Koulibaly. Uh, so basically, uh, well, you could interpret it uh, in your own way, of course. So about uh, the uh, common uh, phrase, Je suis Charlie, referring to freedom of expression, well, he combined it with uh, the surname of, uh, of a terrorist suspect at that time. Uh, so do you think this kind of speech uh, uh, should be prohibited and why? Uh, what kind of harm, what kind of damage could come from it. Just uh, perhaps think about it. And then on the next slide, you will see a slight variation on this. What if an unknown, uh, sorry, the previous slide, <laughs> an unknown 16 year old was posting a message like this, uh, congratulating terrorists on social media. Would that make a difference between a quite a well-known uh, comic? Um, we can skip the next slide because we don't have time for, uh, for all of the slides, unfortunately. Uh, but um, let me first start asking, um, why is it at all important to guarantee freedom of expression, to even speak about freedom of expression when it comes to, well, extremists, uh, terrorist speech, etc. Well, on the next slide, um, you will uh, see a start of uh, an answer. Why is it important? Well, first of all, because terrorism is still a uh, contested concept. Yeah? So when you prohibit, um, well, provoking terrorism, glorifying or justifying terrorism, then um, you possibly prohibit the whole discussion of whether it would be legitimate to uh, engage in certain actions that we should perhaps have a discussion about. Uh, think about about the ANC being on the US terrorist list uh, for quite a long time still, yeah? uh, whereas um, many people would also consider uh, Mandela and uh, the ANC as, uh, well, uh, fighting for freedom, although, of course, um, there were also aspects of uh, violence there um, uh, that uh, need to be denounced. Well, um, I think of people wearing t-shirts with Che Guevara's image, uh, are you then glorifying terrorism? Um, well, uh, all kinds of uh, discussions because terrorism is still, uh, well, there, it's impossible to get at a definition that everybody agrees with. We have to keep talking about these things. When could, uh, what, could violence ever, ever be legitimate or not? Well, if we can't even discuss it in the context of cases like these, then, uh, well, uh, that's quite an important discussion to have, uh, uh, many people would say. Um, then on the next slide, you will see some other reasons uh, why it's also important to um, to take freedom of expression at least into account. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, the most important um, argument. It can be trumped perhaps by uh, other reasons like protecting the rights of others. But it is important as a legitimate way to express one's grievances, uh, which uh, may um, uh, if you can't express your grievances anymore in the political or societal sphere, uh, then uh, the, the, the 
uh, well, resort to violence might uh, uh, be a possibility for some people who can't uh, do that in a legitimate way. Uh, then the issue of endangerment offenses, how far can we go um, criminalizing behavior, so to say, at the pre-phase uh, of uh, potential attacks. Uh, so what we see in those offenses in many countries, offenses of incitement to terrorism, of glorifying terrorism, it's not usually required that this speech would actually lead to violence or that it uh, would even cause a real and present danger that violence could occur as a result of the speech. Yeah. So um, yeah, there, uh, it can be uh, quite an issue to um, decide which of these offenses are legitimate and when we are a bit too, too far into the preface and more like criminalizing intentions. And also because uh, uh, another reason, well, I will skip this one and go to the next slide here um, to, um, sorry, next, next slide. Yeah, to the question of international law and um, international law, we have to take into, into account two important topics when it comes to terrorist speech or extreme speech. On the one hand, there are, so to say, positive obligations to criminalize certain types of speech. So states are actually uh, required um, to criminalize, for instance, incitement to terrorism. And on the other hand, then there is the right to freedom of expression. Um, uh, and I will focus here on the European Court of Human Rights, um, uh, which has uh, some uh, interesting guidelines that we have to take into account there. Yeah, so here you can find the uh, international positive obligations um, just very quickly. So the UN Security Council resolution uh, requires prohibition of incitement to terrorism. Then there are some Council of Europe and EU instruments that uh, require states to criminalize public provocation of terrorism. And all of these instruments also stress that it's important to take freedom of expression into account. But then what what does that mean? So on the next slide you will uh, see from here, yeah, the general framework that the European uh, Court of Human Rights uses uh, that you can find in Article 10 on freedom of expression. Um, it's not an absolute right, but an interference has to be prescribed by a clear law. Um, it has to serve a legitimate aim like national security. Um, so these requirements are not the most difficult, but the most difficult balance is found in, in that last part on is it necessary in a democratic society to prohibit this type of speech. Uh, it has to be a proportionate restriction, uh, for instance, uh, well, a long prison sentence, maybe uh, it may easily be disproportionate. There has to be a pressing social need to prohibit the speech and the state must provide relevant and sufficient reasons for it. Uh, so this applies not only to criminal law restrictions, but also to other types of restrictions of speech, but also Obviously, uh, criminal law is one of the heaviest ways in which you can uh, deal with these things, right? Uh, because it can lead to prison sentences, etc. So on the next slide, um, you will see, well, one of the most important questions we have to deal with, I think, today, what concrete principles can be used? And these are the ones that the European Court uses, but, um, well, I guess um, these are uh, quite universal uh, uh, principles uh, that we can take into account uh, generally when dealing with speech in the context of terrorism that can inspire us to make that balance. Uh, so um, where uh, can we start here on the next slide we will see uh, first of all, and this is not so concrete yet, but um, uh, a fair balance has to be struck between the individual's rights to freedom of expression um, and a democratic society's legitimate right to protect itself against the activities of terrorist organizations. Um, well, that is still uh, quite obvious. 
Um, then, uh, in principle, states have a so-called margin of appreciation to assess which expressions they uh, will restrict, because national authorities are in the best uh, position to decide about this and to know their own national context. Uh, then it's important uh, that the European Court always stresses um, that uh, if expressions are part of a debate on a matter of general and public concern, then there is not much room uh, for restricting speech. Uh, so, for instance, a debate about uh, state violence against minority groups, well, it's not uh, so easily uh, restricted yeah, without coming into conflict with freedom of expression. Okay, so in principle, the European Court uh, uh, continues to um, stress that expressions that are liable to offend, shock or disturb uh, are protected by Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, so by the right to freedom of expression. Um, although when you look at concrete cases, it, it can be quite difficult to uh, distinguish between shocking uh, or offensive speech um, and, uh, uh, well, which should be protected versus speech that goes too far, yeah? a speech that actually, for instance, incites to violence. Sometimes the line to be drawn is not that easy. On the next slide, um, you will see that states have a large leeway to prohibit speech that incites to violence or to hostility or hatred against individuals, groups or officials. So that's um, a rather broad category, but incitement to violence is uh, yeah, it's quite a clear line, you could say. Uh, we've seen this, for instance, in um, uh, the case of Belkacem uh, versus Belgium, uh, the uh, head of uh, Sharia for Belgium, who was sentenced uh, for posting uh, several YouTube videos in which he called for uh, not only for Sharia law to be enforced in Belgium, but also called on his followers to uh, target non-Muslims and he advocated jihad. So uh, there uh, the court actually easily uh, dismissed uh, the call for freedom of expression. Um, on the next slide, um, you will see some other principles uh, uh, including does an expression have the potential to lead to harmful consequences? So is it capable of inciting to violence, hatred or intolerance? Uh, so uh, even though it's not required that it eventually leads to actual violence or hatred, um, it is important to look at the potential of the speech. So looking at the speech itself, the expression, um, does it have this potential? And this in turn depends on many factors because of course the uh, local context can be uh, very important there. Many of the cases that the court has ruled on uh, are cases on uh, the, the, the local context of Southeast Turkey and the PK KK, um, and they do take this into account if a region is already prone to quite a lot of violence, uh, then an expression, even if it's not so clearly and directly inciting to violence, may uh, more easily lead to further violence because of this history uh, that um, is there. So uh, that does play a role. Uh, in the case of uh, Zana versus Turkey, uh, this was about a former mayor um, of uh, Diyarbakir in Southeast Turkey who gave an interview uh, to journalists uh, where he indicated he supported the PKK national liberation movement. Uh, and he said uh, he was not in favor of massacres, but he also said that anyone can make mistakes and they uh, kill children and women by mistake. Well, 
uh, that led to a, cr a criminal conviction um, where the court uh, looked at this context surrounding the expression. So at the time the interview was given, there were quite some murderous attacks by the PKK uh, on civilians in the region. There were extreme tensions. And so the court concluded in these circumstances, uh, this expression of support um, can actually exacerbate this explosive situation. Um, so uh, one of the issues that can of course happen is that uh, with expressions taking place online, many expressions, you can quickly lose track of these contextual elements. So it goes in all kinds of directions uh, to different countries. So how can we accommodate for that? Uh, the European Court has not really dealt with this uh, issue explicitly, how we should take into account that an expression can travel all over the world so quickly and be seen by people who perhaps sometimes don't know the local context, etc. Um, so another uh, important uh, guideline is when are the expressions published, right? Are they uh, pub published shortly after terrorist attacks? Uh, then this can play a role as well. Uh, the role and authority of the speaker, yeah? a mayor, as I just said, in that case uh, is, uh, can be um, uh, quite influential. So then it can be more easily prohibited. Although on the other hand, you uh, also see a lot of cases where politicians, um, uh, because mostly their speech will take place in the context of a public and political debate, there's also quite some room for freedom of expression in that context. So it's a bit double. What kind of media outlet? So an academic book uh, or a biography is different, will probably be less directly inciting people to violence than, um, well, a massive call through social media, for instance. Uh, media themselves can, by the way, also sometimes be um, uh, convicted, criminally convicted by publishing the statements of others. But then, of course, it really does depend on the way they do this, on their own intention, etc. Uh, so it's not, it's certainly not automatically allowed to do that. Uh, they should also, of course, uh, it's really important that we know what's happening in the world. So if media couldn't write about that anymore, that would be really problematic, but it wouldn't, it shouldn't become uh, a pretext for actually uh, publishing an incitement. The provocative wording obviously plays um, in an important role. So do expressions contribute to a peaceful resolution of political problems or do they stigmatize the other party to a conflict, for instance? Uh, and on the next slide, um, you will see a glorification or justification of violence. Can that also be criminalized next to direct incitement? Well, it depends. Um, at the European Court in the case of Le Roi uh, versus France uh, was not so strict uh, and, uh, and actually indicated that uh, criminalization of glorifying terrorism can uh, sometimes be justified. That was a cartoon um, by, um, uh, well, a cartoon published in a Basque uh, newspaper. Um, and it was published two days after the 9-11 attacks. And it included a, a picture of the Twin Towers with the caption, we, all, we have all dreamt of it, Hamas did it. Well, uh, whatever you think of this, um, uh, the, the um, court uh, said that, uh, well, criminalizing this, uh, this cartoonist did not violate freedom of expression uh, because, um, well, even though the cartoonist said, well, the, for me, this represents my criticism of the United States, um, the court found that depicting the attacks as a dream finally come true is particularly offensive and shocking for the victims and their family. So this is where uh, it's interesting because, well, offensive and shocking speech is generally allowed according to the court, but here 
perhaps uh, a bit more difficult. Uh, and they also pointed to the fact that it was uh, presented to the world just two days after the uh, attacks uh, and also in the Basque region where there was also still uh, a risk of terrorism. So, so glorification in all of these circumstances could perhaps have more consequences. Um, so in this case, uh, it was um, allowed. Um, but, um, well, there are also some more critical uh, sounds here uh, in this uh, case against Turkey from 2013. Um, people were convicted for offering a mark of respect to um, uh, Abdullah Öcalan. Uh, because they uh, they sent uh, letters uh, ending with the wording, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm not uh, pronouncing it correctly, but uh, it reads like Sayin, which would mean respected or dear. Uh, so it's an attribute placed before a person's name, a mark of respect before a Chalan's name. Um, and they were uh, convicted uh, here for this mark of respect. Uh, and the court said this was not necessary to prohibit this uh, in a democratic society, uh, this, uh, if it's not an incitement to violence or terror, and it's not propaganda for a terrorist organization. Uh, plus, um, um, it didn't appear uh, that there was a clear and imminent danger to justify prohibiting this speech well, this, uh, this shouldn't be criminalized. So they, they seem to become um, a bit more strict here uh, than in earlier cases, eh? uh, talking about a clear and imminent danger of violence, etc. So, well, um, other human rights uh, in, institutes are also uh, more critical of these types of laws. The UN Human Rights Committee, for instance, has said that offenses like encouraging terrorism or extremist activity, gl glorifying, praising, etc., should be clearly defined to ensure that they don't lead to unnecessary or disproportionate interference with freedom of expression. Uh, so they don't outlaw it, but um, yeah, they are critical. Um, and yeah, let's, um, uh, I guess it's already over time, so let's keep it at this. Um, there are, um, oh, here there's still some general guidelines. Uh, I guess this is the last uh, important uh, slide in that. Field. So there is definitely strong room, uh, room for strong criticism of governments, even in very provocative wording and um, yeah, subversive speech, uh, so to say, uh, so speech um, that, um, uh, well, uh, deals with issues like separatism. Uh, can also fall within the boundaries of freedom of expression unless there is also really an incitement to uh, do so or hate speech against the other party of the conflict. Um, so it's quite a nuanced picture. Uh, I guess it leaves you perhaps with more questions than answers uh, about how to deal with this in concrete cases. Well, uh, that uh, that problem uh, will not be solved. I guess it's always, uh, there are so many factors at play if you want to uh, uh, make this balance. And um, well, uh, it, let's see um, how uh, all of these issues will uh, develop uh, in these times where we also see, uh, um, as uh, Lisbeth referred to, um, uh, a lot of things happening in France, for instance. Uh, so I wonder, um, yeah, if uh, expressions uh, in the field of extremism, terrorism, uh, what room there will be for those expressions and how the European courts, uh, will they become stricter or will they, will they perhaps uh, take into account uh, these kinds of uh, uh, societal developments as well. So um, thank you uh, and I look forward to answering your questions.
Thank you, Marlis. That was a fantastic presentation. I think, as you said, probably raises a lot more questions, uh, perhaps than than any uh, any any presentation could answer. So, I'm sure there will be lots of uh, inputs for the Q and A session. Uh, we will turn over to uh, Professor Robert Kahn for his presentation before hopefully having some time at the end for some of the Q and A. Robert, over to you. Uh Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to uh, be here. Uh, it's uh, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, would it be possible to put up the PowerPoint presentation? So yeah, great. Can you go to the uh, next slide? So. The subject of my talk is about freedom of speech in the US and its relationship to terrorism. And in particular, I'm focusing on uh, a paradox that the United States prides itself on protecting freedom of speech, but it leads the world in percentage of people incarcerated. Uh, some prisoners are serving decade long sentences for offering material support to declared foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, and I'm exploring how this is possible uh, in a land of that sees itself as freedom of speech. Uh, to highlight this, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want to look at a case study uh, of Amer Sinan Ahagagi. He was 23 years old, a graduate of Berkeley High School. Uh, he set up social media accounts for ISIS members that he met in a chat room, eight accounts, a relatively small number, two separate occasions. Uh, there was, this isn't pure speech, uh, but it is a nonviolent act. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of interesting is the difference between speech and conduct terrorist, pro-terrorist speech is theoretically protected, conduct, uh, not so much. Uh, and there is no allegation that al Hagagi was connected with an actual terror attack. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what happened to him? He pled guilty for giving material support uh, to a foreign terrorist organization. He was sentenced to 188 months imprisonment, about 15 years. The prosecution wanted more than uh, twice that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a puzzling outcome. Uh, 15 years for a nonviolent crime, not directly connected to a terror attack. So as Marlou said, it's one thing if it's immediately after the attack, this was at a nondescript time. Uh, defendant claimed it was a joke and that he was an internet troll and he was just being funny. That may or may not be true. He did plead guilty. This rubs up against Brandenburg v. Ohio, which is the US version of the incitement test. Uh, and the key words there are incitement to imminent lawless action. So it's not just incitement to terror, it's incitement to an immediate attack. And there's a question about what would actually have happened here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we bring in the material support law. This was enacted in 1996, and it punishes supporting groups on a list of declared foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, the ANC was on that list. ISIS is now. Material support is drawn very broadly. It includes not only training and expert advice, but also services. And almost anything can be a service. Uh, it's been used in over 400 cases, including many involving nonviolent acts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the case was challenged under the First Amendment. Uh, and it involved uh, a question about whether the humanitarian law project could offer support for the legitimate activities of groups like the PKK or the Tamil Tigers. 
for instance, training on the use of international law to resolve disputes, advocacy on the behalf of Kurds living in Turkey, or teaching how to petition uh, the UN. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so it didn't work out too well for the Humanitarian Law Association. The court upheld the law. Uh, it said that the advocacy that they wanted to do was pure political speech, which usually in the United States receives strict scrutiny, but this scrutiny was overcome uh, because even lawful support can confer legitimacy on a uh, foreign terrorist group, again, going to a point that Marlouz represented in her presentation about the kinds of conversations that you can and can't have. And support is fungible. So if you uh, give a foreign terrorist group training, maybe it can be turned into cash. Uh, and dispute resolution training could be used to create a piece that the terror group could use to buy time. And the court mentioned the PKK uh, doing just that. Uh, next slide, please. So while this is a speech restrictive result, there were some uh, exceptions. So the law only covers acts done in coordination with the foreign terrorist group, not independent advocacy. Uh, so there's a question about what that means. Uh, second, it only covers foreign terror organizations, not domestic groups. So someone supporting the Ku Klux Klan could not be tried under this act. Uh, you know, and you can think a little bit about the role of the US in the world and with this. And the ruling and holder only applies to speech involving foreign relations and national security. So that despite Holder, which you could think of as restricting speech, for the next decade, the US Supreme Court has continued to defend speech in cases like Snyder v. Phelps, which uh, upheld the right of the uh, Westboro Baptist Church to engage in homophobic ranting outside of the funerals of fallen gay soldiers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, so can we go to the, yeah, thanks. So returning to the Al Hagagi case, uh, he did set up social media accounts. He did it in coordination with ISIS. Uh, this is very easy. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the accounts were done for legitimate purposes. So he asked for a four year sentence. This isn't surprising, he violated the law. Uh, Next slide. But he got a 15 year sentence. Uh, and what I want to talk about now is uh, why that happened. Uh, so, next slide, please. Uh, the United States has sentencing guidelines for federal crimes. They focus on two factors the severity of the offense, uh, 1 to 44, 44 is worst and criminal history from one to six, six is worse. Sentences are given in months and judges have a limited ability to adjust sentences, but pretty limited. Uh, the issue here was the terrorism enhancement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was enacted in, uh, actually, can you go back one? Thanks. Uh, this was enacted in 1994 and it basically says if uh, the defendant's crime was an act of terrorism, the severity of the offense has to be increased 12 levels. It has to be at least a level 32 uh, and the criminal history is automatically a six, the highest category. This assumes that terrorists will uh, recidivate, they can't be rehabilitated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the terror enhancement applies uh, if the act is calculated to influence uh, or affect the conduct of government by intimidation or coercion, or uh, it retaliates against government conduct. 
you know, it's a definition of an act of terrorism, which seems logical, but the way it plays out, it has some uh, unusual consequences. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at the Al Hagagi case, uh, it doesn't matter that he didn't personally intend to intimidate, coerce, or retaliate when he set up the social media accounts. The test is that ISIS does these things, uh, and uh, ISIS uses social media, uh, so the enhancement applies. Uh, next slide. Uh, the judge couldn't go all the way. So while uh, he did apply the offense enhancement, he kept the criminal history at a one because Al Hagagi had no priors. Uh, so the sentence was 15 years. Uh, it is uh, uh, currently uh, on appeal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the recent attack in Paris and use it as a case study. I'm a little behind the times, particularly when I wrote the presentation, but I think it raises some aspects of uh, important aspects of the nature of material support laws. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the focus here is Ibrahim Shanina, uh, the father of the student uh, at the school. And he complained to the school. He made a YouTube video and uh, is suspected of issuing a fatwa against Pati. Uh, next slide, please. The fatwa would clearly violate another section of the material support law, which involves furthering an act of terrorism. But the other activities are harder to prove. If all he did was complain against the school, this looks like legitimate political activity. Uh, the YouTube video is a closer case. Uh, would revealing the address and name of the teacher uh, be done? Uh, in coordination with a foreign terrorist group to which the attacker belonged. Uh, the thing that's concerning here, particularly is the complaint against the school and the idea that a complaint, if it were somehow coordinated, uh, could lead to a lengthy sentence. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here you see the operation of the terrorism enhancement, assuming that there was coordination. The attack itself uh, easily satisfies the intimidate, coerce, retaliate standard. Social media was used to help identify Patti or was used by the foreign terror group in the past. Uh, and as a result, even if Shanina had only wanted to complain about the school, uh, if there was coordination, he could be subject to a a uh, decade-long uh, prison sentence. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this leads to the odd that or dualistic nature of US speech protection. You can say whatever you want in support of a terrorist ideology, as long as it falls short of incitement to uh, imminent lawless activity. But if coordination exists, even mundane acts of support can lead to lengthy sentences. Uh, next slide. Uh, in the last part of the presentation, which you know I will run through a little more quickly, I look at the comparison between the material support laws, uh, which target largely Muslims, uh, though also environmental activists, and the war on drugs in the 80s, 90s, and double zeros that has been referred to as the new Jim Crow. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, the history of mass incarceration in the US in the 80s and 90s is well known. It is now 
there have been moves in the last five or six years to roll it back. Next slide. The question is whether the lessons that we'll learn about this for the war on terror and the material support uh, law, and I'll close on this slide. Uh, I think there are three of them. One is unfairness. A nonviolent offender such as Al Hagagi can be sentenced to as much time as someone who was led on by the feds and exploded a fake bomb. It's wrong headed because it assumes without evidence that terrorists cannot be rehabilitated or that terrorists always recidivate. Uh, and there's been a lot of academic and judicial resistance on this point, as we saw in the Al Hagagi case. Finally, the mass use of uh, this statute can be counterproductive because it carries stigma to the home communities of the defendants, closes off sources of information, and can radicalize young defendants. Uh, and can you go forward? Uh, there's some hope that things will get better in part because of the decriminalization that's slowly beginning to happen in response to the war on uh, drugs. Next slide, please. Uh, so the material support laws are a hole in the heart of the First Amendment. Uh, the hope is that there will be some rollback uh, inspired by the changes uh, with uh, the excessive drug sentences and that uh, the coordination requirements of material support will be read tightly and the sentencing guidelines will be revised. Uh, thanks for having me. I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, so just to sort of inform the attendees, I think we're going to let it run over a little bit just so that we have uh, maybe 15 minutes or so to, to discuss some uh, questions that have come in. Um, and so perhaps I will uh, go ahead and just dive right in. So I, I believe, um, you know, both of you have perhaps uh, particularly Marluz touched upon how states have a considerable leeway to prohibit speech that incites violence, hostility, uh, or hatred against individuals. Um, and I was wondering if uh, you might be able to speak about that sort of obligation or, or right of the state um, in relation to the recent remarks, for example, that were made by President Macron in France after the Paddy beheading, which has caused um, obviously a lot of tension, particularly with the Muslim world, and a lot of people um, see that, although maybe he didn't explicitly make, um, uh, you know, directly derogatory comments, there, there seemed to be quite a strong undercurrent of anti-Islamic sentiment in his statements, and certainly in the actions that uh, the French government is now going to be taking domestically. So I would, was wondering if you could speak a bit about that and how that maybe is also playing into this issue of being perhaps, uh, you know, fueling some some hatred towards the Muslim community. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the good question. Um, I um, well. Uh, just thinking about uh, the, uh, what has been said, I'm not thinking directly about hate speech laws as such, um, because they have well a bit higher requirements than what we see here. Uh, so yeah, it has to be either um, uh, really inciting to hatred or discrimination, or uh, be really a defamation of the group. Uh, so. Um, yeah, the, the way Macron has uh, has um, uh, debated these issues uh, uh, will probably not uh, meet that standard. Um, but that, well, uh, th th still, it's of course uh, broader than a criminal law issue to debate, eh? um, and not every. Uh, kind of speech that is, uh, well, that could have negative uh, uh, 
consequences or that uh, we disagree with uh, has to be dealt with by law. And uh, the, the debate here is, well, what is a good thing to say and what is not for a figure in a position like that? And uh, in what way can, uh, can powerful figures actually try to, um, well, make sure that everybody feels welcome in their own country, actually. So that's more, that's a more important debate, I would say, to have than think about uh, uh, the role of, uh, of prohibitions here. Uh, thank you, Marlos. If I can maybe then uh, send a question over to, to Robert. Um, you mentioned in your presentation how there is sort of a quite a disparate application or a disparate rather impact, perhaps, let's say, of, uh, of a lot of the US restrictions on hate speech because there needs to be this link with a foreign terrorist organization. So therefore, it, it doesn't tend to be uh, something that is able to be applied to, for example, right-wing extremists, um, because only at this point, I think one organization who is linked to right-wing extremism has been designated as an FTO. Is this impact something that you think is, um, you know, intentional on, on the part of, uh, you know, U.S. legislators? And also, how is that sort of impacting this entire debate um, and perhaps also perhaps fueling some some uh, grievances or even some radicalization, perhaps? I think that part of it is the origins of the anti terror laws in the US, the material support laws in response to the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993, as well as the criminalization of uh, minor level drug crimes so that there's a separate question about what you can do about the Ku Klux Klan uh, or other right wing groups. And there's an understanding that you can take uh, strong stances against them. Public leaders can say things like Macron has done, uh, you know, did not agreeing that I'm not agreeing with the content necessarily here, but that there's a difference between what a leader says and legislative action. Uh, the line in the US has always been between speech, which you're not allowed to punish and conduct. So uh, in a lot of instances where someone, if I punch somebody, uh, and I do it for no reason in particular, I'll have a short sentence, but if I punch somebody and do it for a reason of hatred, I could have a hate crime added to it. So that's common and is used against extremists and hate speakers of all varieties. The disparate nature here is that you have an overreaction in response to uh, the war on terror and concern, legitimate concerns about terrorism that leads to situations where individuals who do minor acts wind up in a lot of trouble. Part of it's also social media. So the 96 law was enacted in part with the idea we're going to cut off the finances of uh, declared foreign terrorist groups and that's in part why they had to be foreign because with the domestic group you could freeze their assets. Things have changed now and with social media everything is happening more rapidly. What it means to support now means set up a chat room, say something positive, have a viral video and that exposes a lot of people to criminal liability when they wouldn't have been in an earlier age. Great, thank you. Um, just since you mentioned uh, social media there, perhaps I would ask both of you if you can speak about the respective American versus either Dutch or more broadly European regimes in terms of what responsibility do different social media platforms have in relation to hate speech that is uploaded? 
Um, obviously, there's been a lot of criticism uh, towards Twitter and Facebook for not being proactive enough in taking this speech down. But where is the line there? And, and what really active uh, steps are they obliged to take? Um, or what do you think that line should be? Um, if you want to also talk about that. Yeah, Perhaps. Should I start here? Yeah, Marlis, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, well, it's uh, it's very difficult, obviously. Um, uh, but um, in terms of their responsibilities, uh, well, the traditional view used to be that they don't have so many responsibilities in this regard, um, and that uh, they only have these at the moment that they uh, that there is a notification made to them about a, a particular speech on their platform. Uh, however, in uh, the European Union, we see this uh, changing now, uh, first of all, with some voluntary codes of practice about how they should deal with hate speech. But in the field of terrorism specifically and terrorist speech, the EU has made a concept for uh, a regulation that would uh, lead to more responsibilities uh, in that regard. Uh, so to deal really with terrorist speech. and. Uh, uh, there might be a possibility that they extend this in the future to other types, like also hate speech against minorities. Although at this moment, they, uh, they want to keep working with the voluntary instruments. Um, but, uh, well, I do think it's important, even though you see uh, these companies, uh, well, reacting to pressure uh, and doing things and removing certain speech, uh, they're... Um, algorithms and the way they uh, earn money is, of course, also partly premised on the most extreme speech leading to the most attention and advertisements. So that is probably the real problem behind it, that they will not so easily want to change. Um, I'm really curious to, to know your opinion, uh, Robert, about this issue. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Myra Luz. Uh, in the US, uh, Congress has insulated uh, social media platforms from liability. There are always challenges to that and the social media companies try to do just enough to prevent things from happening. Uh, I think the real issue though is algorithms and the type of surveillance capitalism that the large companies like Google use to mine information and encourage people to behave in ways that are easily identifiable and predictable. And uh, the aggregation of speech helps to create bubbles that reinforce uh, more extreme views. You don't like mask wearing and then all of a sudden you have a you know, video of people, you know, wanting to kidnap the governor of Michigan. I'm not real, just a joke, but like, uh, so yeah, I think it's a real problem. And honestly, it's made more difficult by the political situation in the United States that uh, you have one political party that engages in openly Islamophobic speech and another political party that part of its coalition involves big tech companies, which makes it less likely to want to do the things that you would really need to do to get to algorithms and to think about how that, how you would unpack that. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Marluz. Um, perhaps if I could ask you sort of more, more generally, in light of the uh, cartoons published, for example, not only by Charlie Hebdo, but by uh, in Denmark uh, a number of years before that. Where does where do subjective characteristics, the fact that you know perhaps millions, if not billions, of people would subjectively perhaps find that that would reach a level of some some form of hate speech, publishing cartoons that are, that are in their eyes blasphemous and deeply offensive. Where does the subjective belief of individuals come into play when we're determining what constitutes hate speech and therefore what could be subject to restriction? Yes. Um, Marlouf, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so good question. Um, yeah, so um, subjective characteristics in hate speech laws uh, that I know of, uh, they don't really play a role. So the idea is exactly to try as a judge to determine objectively if a certain expression is indeed inciting to hatred or could incite to discrimination or could be, uh, well, even sometimes defamatory. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a law on group defamation as well. But even there, it doesn't have to be proven that an individual or a group uh, uh, felt defamed, felt insulted by that expression. So you have to look objectively, um, is this expression inciting to hatred, etc., uh, 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 towards that group of people. And that's immediately also a difficulty when speaking about uh, blasphemy and the, difficult, the difference between blasphemy and hate speech. And so uh, defaming uh, a god or religious figure or religious symbol, etc., versus um, inciting to hatred against people. Uh, and well, it's difficult. Many people would uh, would say that for them, um, uh, defaming uh, a loved symbol, a loved figure, um, uh, an, a sacred figure for them would uh, have even uh, worse consequences for their psychological well-being than saying something against themselves as people. Uh, but in terms of how the law should deal with this, uh, we see in many European countries a tendency to decriminalize blasphemy. Uh, so they would still all have hate speech laws, including the prohibition of hate speech on the ground of religion. Uh, but they would decriminalize their blasphemy laws, including the Netherlands a few years ago. And the idea behind that would be uh, that religions, including their figures and symbols, could also represent powerful systems uh, that would deserve uh, societal debate uh, about, uh, well, uh, uh, all aspects pertaining to that religion that, uh, well, uh, uh, play a role in society and that people would want to talk about and debate. Um, so in that sense, uh, in terms of the right to freedom of expression, it's especially important to have that if powerful institutions in society uh, uh, are um, uh, well, are to be debated, so to say. Um, at the same time, uh, well, it's a difficult line to draw, especially uh, with some cartoons uh, where you could uh, um, doubt whether this is indeed the intention uh, to, uh, to have a real debate or is the intention actually to uh, insult people and uh, uh, spread hatred against them. So that's always contextual um, as well. But I do think in general, we should be, um, uh, we shouldn't be uh, criminalizing um, uh, uh, expressions about religions too easily because, because of the right to freedom of expression. That's especially important there. Um, however, uh, well, as I said, uh, it, it depends on the exact context and what is being said. Yeah. Yeah, Robert, I, I know that you've also looked a lot at defamation of religion. So I'm very curious to know what your perspective is and, and whether it aligns with Marlousis or, or perhaps is a bit distinct. So perhaps uh, we can give you the floor and I believe that will be the, the last that we have time for this evening. Uh, just a quick note to say the recording will be made available uh, for those who want to rewatch. But uh, Robert, perhaps I can turn it over to you. So I largely agree with Marluz about freedom of speech. What I'd emphasize is the fluid nature of symbols. And that if you look at the 12 uh, Danish cartoons, you know, a couple of them clearly have Islamophobic content to it that you would have to ask anyone about. There are others that become that way because they're connected with the more offensive cartoons. And then when the cartoons are routinely shown over and over again, they have the, they send a message of, I hate Muslims, I hate Islam. They also send a message of freedom of speech. Uh, 
symbols can have different things for different people. But I think there'd be an understanding that when you gratuitously show the cartoons, uh, perhaps you're sending a message of animus, even if it is one that is, uh, you know, unintentional, just the way the, you know, burkini wearer. So let's not talk about burkas, but, you know, the burkini wearer is seen as a symbol of Islamism, but it may actually just be that this person wants to go swimming. And it's balancing that. And I think that we would all do well to have greater toleration of symbolic expression and to really put the focus on when that expression is threatening in an immediate direct sort of way. On that uh, quite profound note, uh, because I am sure that we could all continue to discuss this literally for hours to come, I think we'll have to wrap it up there. Um, but I wanted to, to thank you, Robert, and you, Marluce, uh, Lisbeth, um, and all of the people who are viewing and who sent in their very, very uh, interesting and thought-provoking questions. Thank you all for your, your efforts. Um, again, the recording will be uh, made live. Um, so you can rewatch or, or share it with those who are registered attendees. Uh, and so on behalf of ICCT, thank you very much.